From Microbe TV, this is Immune, episode number 55, recorded on April 27th, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast about the body's defenders against disease. Joining me today from Ithaca, New York, Cindy Leifer. Welcome back. Winter's is, almost over here. <laughs> you know, I, I did a pod with someone in Salt Lake, and they had 30 inches of snow in the mountains at the ski resorts over the weekend. <laughs> That's nuts. We that had a, we had a little flurries here this morning, but it's it's warmer. We had 85 the other day and then snow. It's very, it's a very confusing time of year. What was the word that someone used? Schizophrenic weather or something yeah, like yeah. that? We're, we're like in third winter. I think. <laughs> like also joining us from Durham, spring. North Carolina, Steph Langle. Hey there. Hey there. Not, not in third winter here. We're definitely <laughs> in first summer. So it was, it was uh, 89 the other day. It's cooled down a little bit. We're in the mid seventies. It's beautiful. Did you get new glasses, Steph? I did. I did. These are kind of clear lenses. You can see yeah. more of my face. Yeah. But the the red ones are very cool. Thank you. I do like the red ones. I'm trying to experiment more with glasses, different colors, different styles. But the red ones could be used again, right? They're not obsolete. Oh, sure. No, I'll, I'll recycle. I'll rotate them. This is your husband's specialty, right? Well, Glasses. this is the th so. This is the thing. My husband's an optometrist, so you do get, <laughs> you know, some access to cool glasses. So, so you could wear a different pair every day, right? I maybe by now I could. I, I don't know how many I have, but yeah, the clear ones are good. I have a clear pair at the incubator that I use to just to see the screen, and um, I, the clear is cool. Yeah. And also joining us from Madison, New Jersey, Brianne Barker. Hi. Uh, it is. Uh, I suppose. Middle spring here. Uh, <laughs> it's 53 and sunny today. Uh, sometimes it gets a little summery. Sometimes it's still a little wintry, but it's kind of nice today. It's, You're it's a little. It. Uh, it's a little early springish, right? Yeah, it's fine. <laughs> at least the sun is out. And now today, I happen to be at Columbia, so I can look mm. out the window and see white puffy clouds, blue sky, and uh, it's uh, what is it here? Let's see, 13C. It's very nice. All right. Now, today's my turn yes. to uh, to lead on a paper, and I'm just way out of my <laughs> comfort zone here. But I, want, I thought this paper was very exciting. And um, with the help of three bona fide immunologists, we can get through the main points. And um, it is a, an article in Science. You know, it's. I just noticed that it's got a, a heading coronavirus. It does. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, there's a part of this paper that's coronavirus, but it's not the main focus no, yet. Not at all. No. It takes over everything. Doesn't it does. It? Yeah, it gets it published in Science. <laughs> anyway, the the article title is "Cure Plus CD8 Plus T Cells Suppress Pathogenic T Cells and Are Active in Autoimmune Diseases and COVID-19." Of course, they put COVID in the title, right? <laughs> so it would get published for sure and so forth. But I did like this dual aspect that they're looking at some mechanism of both autoimmunity and and infectious diseases, and maybe there's a commonality there. So uh, I will do my best and um, my colleagues will <laughs> help me out. They, they assured me they would help me out. Yeah, we will. We'll yes. pop yeah, in, well, in and out. You'll do great, though. We'll read it carefully. In particular, <laughs> in particular Cindy's going to tell us if uh -oh. the plots are actually real or not, yeah. if there are differences. I know that's your specialty. Uh, yeah. I have some, I have some comments. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think we all might have comments on that one. <laughs> all right. So it, my understanding is that for a while, some CD8 T cells um, have uh, been thought to suppress autoimmune responses. Everyone knows CD8 t, t cells do other things. Um, they can, uh, for example, become cytotoxic T lymphocytes. But uh, some may suppress autoimmune responses. And uh, again, my understanding is this was first uh, determined in a mouse model of, of uh, multiple sclerosis, which is called experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis, EAE which I have to say I heard about in grad school, which was in the 70s. Yep, yep. So they've been doing it for a while. been doing yeah. it for a long time. 
And, and uh, what the two things that you just mentioned speak broadly to uh, a couple concepts in immunology. So one being that, you know, we discovered CD4 and CD8 T cells and CD4 cells are the helper cells and CD8 cells are the cytotoxic cells and they kill infected cells. And what we now know with more technology, better ways to define cells is that there's a there are heterogeneous populations within these big CD4 and CD8 classes, which we'll talk about. So that's one. And two, a lot of these uh, heterogeneous populations, these rare subsets are found in mice. And it is really always the question of, can we find these in humans? Do they express the same markers? And single cell sequencing technology allows us to kind of get more into the weeds of that. So I just wanted to bring that up that we're kind of touching on two two kind of big themes here. Yeah. And so when I was reading this, it made me think about some sort of, of the history of actually some of those CD4 subsets a little bit mm-hmm. um, and how that was described. And so some of this is um, kind of what I've been told about uh, <laughs> the things that happened in the past of immunology, um, moving into some things that that I'm aware of. I can talk about a little bit of how I learned something as an undergraduate and how that still stuck with me on that this front um, because of this. So I am told that there was a, a uh, hearty sort of study of um, T cells that could turn off other T cells um, and potentially suppress other T cells um, in the past. don't know exactly when that past was, uh, 70s, 80s maybe. Um, they were known as suppressor T cells. Yep. Um, and um, those T cells were then shown to be or questioned in terms of whether they were, in fact, uh, really relevant. Um, part of it was the relationship to a, a particular type of gene um, in terms of some linkage studies that then when um, genome sequencing happened, there turned out to not be a gene there. Um among other things. And my understanding of what happened was that a fair number of immunologists were kind of like, what? Suppressor cells? Oh, no, I never believed that. Yep. Um, at, to the point where what I learned as an undergrad is that the word suppressor was a dirty word. Oh, That's yeah. one of two words I was basically taught to not say. And even That's now crazy. I feel like lightning is going to strike me down if I say that <laughs> word as well as one other. Um, <laughs> and then as always happens, they get reinvented, yeah. right? They re- de- rediscovered and given yeah. a different name. And then that name was okay yeah. to and regulatory so, cells. So right? yeah. And then there was this discovery um, by Sakaguchi, uh, some of the papers and uh, by Shivak um, mm-hmm. yeah. of this CD4 subset, the regulatory T cell, because of course it's not a suppressor T cell. It, it's a regulatory T cell. Right. <laughs> yep. um, that's, uh, and so again, this is a CD4 type of cell that could... Um, regulate or turn off other cell types. Um, And it took a little while to have people fully kind of embrace the cell subset. Um, First, there was discussion of a particular cell surface marker, CD25, um, that was on those cells. And then um, one of the things that became really uh, helpful was a particular transcription factor that defined the lineage. FOXP3 was described and sort of um, this lineage of the CD4 regulatory T cell became Tregs, this well understood and well known lineage that we have now. Um, but there has not kind of been a parallel set of CD8 cells um, that has uh, come around or been re-described or re-understood um, in the same way that Tregs have been. And so this paper to me is sort of trying to describe or start to get at a parallel CD8 type of cell. Um, And they talk a little bit about some experiments that they had done previously in mice, trying to define such a cell type. They talk about a particular cell surface marker, um, the uh, LY49 marker on those CD8 T cells. They talk about a particular transcription factor that might define the lineage Helios. Um, But the idea is now trying to find this same kind of unique regulatory cell um, in humans and in in human situations, and so to me, it felt very parallel hmm. um, to my recollection of that whole um, T reg story. Interesting, and and also parallel. When I went to start digging about this, there's a lot of controversy about these Li49 mm-hmm. CD8 positive T cells and what they're actually doing. 
because there's evidence that they're, uh, you know, cytotoxic, and then there's evidence that they're regulatory, that they promote disease or they inhibit disease. And so I think that is very muddy. And, you know, the, the authors of this paper really referenced the work they had done that was pointing towards the regulatory phenotype and didn't really address the controversy, I think. Yeah, I, when I was a grad student, Brianne, I, I remember the suppressor T cell story yep. by Richard Gershon from Yale. And um, yeah, you're right, a lot of controversy, and people didn't believe it. And nope. it went away. I remember yep, it went it away and was reborn as T Rex. Yep. yep. <laughs> when now, now it's got some. And unfortunately, uh, he, he committed suicide. And I don't know if it had anything to do oh, with gosh. Oh, I didn't know failure. That. But huh. I know because his brother is here at Columbia, Michael Gershon. He's still here. Wow. And um, yeah, he um, often talks about it. Yeah. Uh, My oh, brother wow. working on – he said, yeah, he discovered them and nobody believed him. It's true. Yeah, <laughs> yep. true, right. I remember that. So yep. the, um, the the evidence starts in mice, as Brianne yep. mentioned. This, these CD8 cells that have LY49 on their surface – uh, that's a marker for a set where they showed if you disrupt a, a co-receptor interacting with CD8, it um, they get spontaneous autoimmune diseases. And so that yep. was the implication of, uh, and Helios is the, the factor involved in the, uh, uh, the, the differentiation of these uh, cells. It subsequently found that these interactions don't just involve that original co-receptor, which is called QA1, but also MHC1. Mm -hmm. And so they're thinking maybe this has a broader relevance uh, than intolerance. So what they do in this paper is to identify killer cell immunoglobulin-like receptor, KIRS, as the functional counterpart of uh, LY of this LY49. Um, hey, we have another family today, Brianne. Yes, yesterday. we do have another family after the, the family we saw yesterday. Um, the, so the LY49 family is uh, relatively well understood in terms of mm -hmm. NK cells. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. So they're an important NK cell receptor um, in mice. Mm -hmm. um, right. And NK cell receptors are known to bind MHC class one. Um, yes. So some. Um, yes, yeah, some of them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, Very confusing. I know. So and so <laughs> these are basically NK receptors that also are found on this group of CD8 T cells. Right. right. Um, so why are they not NK T cells, right? <laughs> right. Mm. I, yeah, I, just, I, I started, as stuff. I was reading this, I'm like, wait, wait, what? No, NK T cells are T cells with NK1.1. NK1. <laughs> so this is a, a, is a T cell with a different NK marker. Yes. Yeah, I I actually was starting to to dig a little bit um, in the nomenclature because I was like, okay, I know NK receptors, and they're and, and one of the important things is that there's positive receptors and negative receptors. So, and that comes to be important in this is that so these killer inhibitory they were originally called killer inhibitory receptors, killer cell inhibitory receptors. But you're right, they changed it to immunoglobulin like for the eye, mm. yeah, because they then they discovered activating. they're <laughs> activating ones, and so. So some of these receptors are long and they have cytoplasmic tails and they're inhibitory. But then some are short and they use a different signaling molecule and they actually activate the NK cell. And so NK, what's, what we always teach about NK cells is they integrate positive and negative signals, mm -hmm. right? And so if there's, if there's no negative signal and there's only a positive signal, that NK cell says, hmm, okay, I need to kill, right? And if it, it receives the signal from the negative receptor, it says, I don't want to kill. And that's going to come back to be important because these are cure receptors that are negative signalers, right? And so, so that they say don't kill. But then it, it's really a balance because mm -hmm. you could still have negative signals, but if you upregulate the positive signals, now you can kill. Or if, if a virus, for example, decides to be clever and says, I'm going to downregulate MHC class one, to which, as Brianne said, many of these cure receptors will bind to, if they downregulate that, the negative signal goes down. And so it's sort of this balance between is there more positive or less negative? You know, where, where are we? And so the, the NK cells integrate that information. And I would say there's not much 
if anything, known about these CD8 positive T cells that express these key receptors and whether they do anything similar to that or whether they only express this one cure and how that contributes to everything that's going on. So it's just something to keep in mind as we, as we go forward talking about these. All right, so these cure positive, CDA positive cells, they think are the, uh, the functional equivalent of the uh, LY49 CD8s in, in mice. We're going to have some evidence for that. And they think they have roles not only in autoimmune diseases, and they look at several in this paper, like celiac disease, and but also in infectious diseases. And they try and make a theory to wrap it all together, but Cindy's already said she doesn't buy it, so <laughs> that's fine. We'll I just say I completely didn't buy it. It's, it's, it's <laughs> another question. You know, right. it's I, I think we actually should step aside for a second, though, yep. and talk about celiac disease, because I think that's a really interesting immunological thing. Um, so celiac disease is a true gluten allergy, and I always mention this because we hear so much about gluten and gluten's bad and people want glu low gluten diets or gluten-free diets. And, and really, I don't, I've not heard much that it makes much of a difference other than if you actually have a gluten allergy. And the gluten allergy is because the gluten is a, a, a complex long molecule that gets chopped down into these monomers that are called gliadin. And they, that can be transaminated by, by this enzyme or transglutaminated by this enzyme, TG2. And what that does is it makes a peptide. And if you don't have the right MHC that combine that peptide, it doesn't matter for you. You're fine. You just digest gluten. You have no problem. The problem is that certain people who have a particular MHC molecule called HLA-DQ2 specifically can bind that deaminated gliadin peptide in the MHC. And for some reason, those T cells were not tolerized during development uh, or, or eliminated during positive, you know, negative selection. And they're available and they can recognize that MHC. And then they can cause disease. And they can also induce antibody production. Then you get antibodies to the gluten molecules. And basically, the, it causes a pretty serious inflammation in the gut and basically um, a failure to obtain nutrients because of the inflammation in the gut. So these, these babies that have this disease, they start to have failure to thrive. And that's how you usually identify this gluten mm. allergy. Um, and yeah, it's a very highly genetically... Um, linked disease because 90% of the individuals who have celiac disease have that HLA-DQ2. Right. So it's very highly linked. And so the um, solution is to... Not eat gluten. Not eat gluten, right? Right. Which, and I, which, I think from looking at this paper, one thing that Cindy mentioned that's super important yeah. is the role of inflammation in celiac Correct. disease because mm -hmm. I think a lot of the situations that they're um, trying to tie these cells to all have inflammation as an underlying Absolutely. Thing, right. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So LY49 and these Kia receptors bind uh, class 1 MHC, which have these inhibitory motifs, as that uh, Cindy mentioned in their cytoplasmic tails, ITIMs, yep. right? So they're on NK cells and also a small number of CD8 uh, positive T cells. So they said, okay, let's look in the blood of people with autoimmune diseases at uh, CD8 cells with, with these cures. So they have a cohort of uh, patients uh, and, and age and gender matched healthy controls. And they, um, they look for um, these, the cure on the surface of these cells. And they find that the frequency of cure positive CD8 positive T cells is increased in the blood of patients with multiple sclerosis, SLE, systemic lupus erythematosus, and celiac disease compared with uh, the blood of healthy controls. All right, so the first hint, ah, this population is, is elevated. Is that new? Do we know that before? I, I don't, don't think so. I don't think so because they have, yeah, this particular CD8 T cell subset, no. But it is interesting to look at the variation in those percent positive mm. <laughs> uh, cure CD8 yes. T cells because the, the significant differences I almost ignore just because they're really driven by some individuals with really high percentages of these cell types. And if yep. you were to take those away, would that really be significant? And there's quite, uh, you know, looking at like the SLE, 
there's a lot of individuals that are at the same levels as the healthy controls. And then the MS patients, there's about half the number included in terms of total patients. So I think we can say certain individuals, and I would like to know, you know, are they actually undergoing some type of inflammatory response due right. to their disease? But it, it, as with all human studies, and again, this is when you're trying to translate human to, to um, mouse to human, there's so much variation in humans. And so you, right. that, that is really showed here. So they did try to ask that though, right? Because they they took ones in active celiac and in remission. Yeah, in the next part. And right. they tried to suggest only, yeah. that, you know, it's higher. But here's yes, my thought agreed. question, and this is where I was stuck with this whole paper. If you have an inflammatory disease and you go to measure inhibitory cells, would you expect them to be higher or lower in an inflammatory disease. I would would have thought they would be lower (laughs) because, so the other problem is if you do have more of them, they must suck at what they do, (laughs) right? (laughs) Because they're clearly not reducing inflammation. Or, yeah, so well, maybe yeah. they are, but then the the way they reduce it, it gives you more, more of a problem, inflammation. Right? Well, that's so, true too. So this reminded me of a an argument that I used to have with my PhD advisor, um, <laughs> because we used to have this argument about um, CD8 levels of CD8 cells in response to virus. And would you expect to have a lot of CD8s when there's a lot of virus, or a lot of CD8s when there's a little virus? Um, and we both we could basically argue either side of it that Depending maybe if you have a lot of CD8s when there's a lot of virus because the large amount of virus would increase the amount of CD8s, right. or maybe you have a lot of CD8 when there's a little virus because the lot of CD8s got rid of the virus. <laughs> and so we we sat and argued that point back and forth sometimes. Um, and I kind of saw this as being something similar that perhaps the excess inflammation was driving yeah. the production of these cells, but you're right, they don't seem to be doing everything they need to be doing. Well, and it's interesting, if we think back to, so Tim Hand had come on the show and he had talked about his paper looking at environmental enteric enteropathies in children and his story was that enteropathy uh, caused an enhancement of TGF beta positive T regulatory cells. And so then the CD4 T cells that were going to respond to the vaccine could not do so right. because of this issue. And so, yes, it is very, I think you have to consider the context of the disease and what is that driving? Um, what type of response? Yeah. So I wondered whether it was the inflammation was driving the cells, but the cells, you're right, were maybe less effective at turning that inflammation back off. So this this study was done with blood cells. So then they say, what right. about the tissues that are inflamed in these diseases? So celiac disease, the gut, um, kidneys for SLE, rheumatoid arthritis patients, synovial tissues. And there they also find elevated levels of these cure CD8 cells. So, so that's a question on this. And, and one, Cindy, I agree with you. I'm glad they did. A B, which which they did do normal remission and active uh, celiac, so you could see the different states. But for for C and D, so uh, and particularly in D, the the number of OA individuals, at least in the, they actually have it switched, but it says it's N of three. But when I look at how many dots are on this graph, mm-hmm. so are they showing us single cells? It does not tell us how mm-hmm. many how how many patients are represented here. There's tons of dots, but only three patients. They say. Yeah. Yeah, I found those super confusing. Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm not sure like, I understand what they did. Yeah. The, and when you look, I tried to f- figure it out. They don't really describe. I, I, my assumption is that these these dots represent single cells because how else could there be that many dots for an N of three? But um, how many patient samples are represented would be really, is it one patient, single cell data? So... I mean, it still shows the same trend that in the in the individuals with the disease, that's when you see the expression, but it's a little hard to tell how many, what the N is here. By the, by the way, I forgot to tell you that this is mostly a group at Stanford <laughs> University. Yeah, but, I mean, it's Mark Davis. It's Mark great Davis. immunology group. Yeah, oh yeah, he's yeah. a fantastic Amazing. immunologist. Um, and uh, yep. the first author is Jing Li. <clears throat> So this department, um, microbiology, uh, where where Mark Davis is, uh, 
I uh, I had an offer from them when I was looking for jobs, and Mark oh. Davis had just moved <laughs> there as well. And they said, "Oh, Mark Davis is here. You should come." But I didn't. I decided to come to Columbia. <laughs> There's too many Seems palm like a trees. Good decision. Out there. Too, too many, many palm, palm trees. trees. Well, there was no virology out there, frankly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, anyway, so next, are these cure CD8 cells functionally equivalent to LY49 CD8s in mice? And they had previously found that these LY49 cells can suppress pathogenic CD4 cells that are recognizing a um, particular protein, myelin oligodendrocyte protein, using perforin, right? A perforin which would be released from the cell, which would poke holes in the membrane, in this case of the CD4 cell, and eventually make it undergo uh, apoptosis, kind of like what CD8 CTLs do, right? Correct. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, as Cindy said, this deamidated gliadin from gluten <laughs> is the antigen for CD4 T cells that drives celiac disease, right, an autoimmune disease. So they asked, can cure CD8 cells suppress gliadin-specific CD4 T cells from uh, celiac patients. So they got peripheral uh, blood mononuclear cells from patients, cultured them, and uh, with or without gluten. And without cure positive CD8 T cells, you get stimulation of expansion of these CD4, gliadin specific CD4 cells. Um, and uh, then if you add stimulated KIR plus CD8 cells, uh, but not KIR minus or KIR NK cells, you reduce the number of these gliadin-specific CD4 T cells. So tell me, when they say stimulated, what are we doing to stimulate them? So antigen-presenting cells have to be present, and they're going to take up the deaminated gluten, or mm -hmm. gliadin, and they will present it in the context of MEC class one or uh, class two, sorry, in this case for CD4 T cells. And those CD4 T cells will get their signals that they need to, to react, and then they'll expand in vitro. And they detect them with what we call a tetramer. So that's a way to, it's a basically a synthetic. Uh, MHC class one molecule with the correct peptide and, and you can incubate it. It's fluorescently labeled and it's okay. connected okay. by stuff. And, and then, so it labels the antigen specific T cells. So they are, they're not showing you all the other T cells that could be there that mm -hmm. maybe do or don't get expanded, but, but the antigen specific T cells are there. If you, um, if you don't have the cure CD8 T cells, um, but they're not there if you do have the cure CD8 T cells. And so right. I guess what I was wondering is, are they are they killing them or are they preventing them from expanding? And that right. wasn't entirely clear to me mm -hmm. from this particular experiment because all the the only readout is at the end of however many days they're asking, are those are those cells present or yeah. not? Right, right. Would what and we'll get to it. But do you think the next experiment with the next and answers that question? So they, yeah. So the, the question then is, you know, did, were they, did they expand and then get killed? Um, and if so, how, or did they fail to expand? And so mm -hmm. one way to ask that is you, you look for a, a, a marker of cell death. And so CD8 T cells, like you said, have perforin and they carry granzyme and basically they poke a hole and they deliver granzyme into the cytoplasm and granzyme is an enzyme that induces, uh, Cell, cell death, autonomous cell death, and so that's how that's how we'll undergo packaging of its components into little bits and spit the bits out, and it basically degrades itself. And one of the first events that happens is lack of maintenance of the plasma membrane structure, and uh, lip, phospholipids that are called phosphatidylserine are usually only present on the interle inner leaflet of the plasma membrane. And when the plasma membrane integrity is lost, it flips to the outside and an XM5 will bind to that. And so you can detect those cells that are basically undergoing apoptosis or a cell death. These uh, Kier CD8s did not recognize influenza virus hemagglutinin specific CD4 T cells, which you to which you've added peptides. So they seem to be specific for these pathogenic CD4 cells. 
and the, the they call it suppression of expansion. They say yeah. this is contact dependent because yep. if you separate the cells with a membrane, it doesn't happen. Mm. Yep. In half. <laughs> In half. It was abrogated, yes. So it's abrogated, right, right. Yes, of course. So it's not zero, right? Right. If you draw that line above the unstimulated, I'm like, oh, yeah. look, 50%. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, that's biology, right? Yes, of course, yes. Yeah. Um, they also found annexin binding on these um, gliadin's T cells uh, in the presence of the cure CD8 cells, which they suggest shows that they can induce apoptosis of those cells, as, as Cindy has just been saying. Yep. So from this, they conclude these cured CD8 cells suppress the pathogenic CD4 cells, in this case, the gliadin-specific ones, by direct killing. And they also do an IL-12 experiment, an IL-2 experiment, where you add a lot of IL-2 and the, the killing still happens. So they say it's direct killing instead of competition for IL-2. Can, can you explain, can we go over that experiment? So, so yeah. what they're saying is IL-2, are they saying because IL-2 can also stimulate CD4 T cell um, into Tregs? I mean, that is one of the cytokines, so they're trying to compete. No, I no. think it's, so Brian, you may, you may comment on this, but so T regulatory cells have multiple mechanisms to suppress expansion of effector T cells. And so some of those include direct contact. Some of them include fast, fast and fast ligand mediated cell deaths. Um, and one of the ways is either competing for nutrients or degrading things um, that they might need. And one of the things is IL-2. So the, the yeah. T regulatory cells can kind of, if they're in high numbers, sop up the IL-2 and then there's limiting amounts of IL-2. So the CD4 T cells need a lot of IL-2 and they can't can't proliferate as well. But there yeah. are a lot of uh, there are a lot of other mechanisms as well. Yeah. Yeah, so I've heard of that mechanism of um, particularly with Tregs um, because of their uh, CD25 expression as them being a cytokine sink um, yep. or basically just sink just soaking up all of the IL2 so that the other potentially pathogenic cells don't have any. Um, and so the idea here is they're showing that if they add so much IL2 that it could not be competed away that the, the cytokine sink cells could not possibly sink it all up. Huh? Um, the um, the it, it doesn't rescue. Yeah, the, the expansion is still blocked. Got it. So it okay. wasn't just that all the IL-2 got used up because if you put in so much IL-2 that it's you could... Still, yeah, it's still, yeah, it still okay. is a problem. Got it. All right, next they say, uh, we know that uh, the, the LY49 cells, their activity in mice is mediated by both classical and non-classical MHC1. Mm -hmm. So, and in fact, the the T-cell receptor is, is required to fully get suppressive function. They show that in an experiment. Plus, if you add antibody, if you blockade HLA, either ABC or E, this partially reverses the suppression uh, caused by the, the cure CD8 T-cell. So they say, it's through recognition of both classical and non-classical class one, like the LY forty-nine right. in the mice. So they're trying to draw that correlate corollary yeah, between parallels. the yeah. two. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. really weak, though. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Even look at. I mean, it's just not again clear to me, um, right, that these differences are biologically relevant, and then yes. Yes. there's other mechanisms that they could have tested. So. Uh, then they do RNA-seq analysis on uh, cure positive and cure negative CD8s in, from their MS patients, and they compare them to uh, similar studies done on LY CD8 cells in uh, EAE -E 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 mice. And they have, you know, lots of genes that are up and down. And I won't go through them unless anyone wants to, but basically that, that they show that the, the cure CD8s in humans and the LY49s in mice share a lot of similarities in terms of uh, upregulated genes. Right. Yep. And I guess there was, I think, one line that said there was 100, you know, out of the 200 DEGs, which is differentially expressed mm -hmm. genes, 100 of them were shared between the two. And I just was like, okay, is a hundred like what's my threshold for thinking of a cell that's that 
the same. Is that enough to yeah, be? Yeah, I, I don't know. I yeah. I thought about that too because uh, there's so much of this gene expression analysis now, especially at the single cell level, and you you want to ask, you know, how similar do they need to be to be called the same thing? I, I will say that from looking at thinking about memory cells between uh, of mouse CD8 memory cells versus human CD8 memory cells, the markers are not always the same. Okay. So I was actually kind of impressed. Oh, so you're like, okay, this is there, actually good. There were a couple to- things where I was like, oh, wow, you got both of those markers to do the same thing in mouse and human. That's amazing. <laughs> Oh, interesting. So again, it is kind of that context dependent. You really you have to be redundant in the way you prove this. You have to prove it by single cell. You got to yeah. prove it by the function, and then you can holistically say, okay, these are similar. So. I think that you know what what was more impressive rather than the number were the types of genes that were shared. Yeah, and, and the so, pathways, yes, right? The path mm-hmm. the, they did do pathway analysis. They did do you know some some analysis of that, and it it was more like the cytotoxic genes mm-hmm. that these types of cells use to kill cells, you know, or induce apoptosis in the cell. So th- those are the kinds of things that one would hope would be shared if if they were f- having the same function. Yeah. And and Vincent, you may be going into this next. I didn't know the part where they discuss high or low expression of, of <laughs> care. Are, are you going to talk about that next or was that a part of the part you were going to move over? Because I just wanted to ask a question about that. Um, I was going to mention this, uh, this idea of uh, in, both inhibitory and, and um, um, activation in effector. Is that? Probably. You go ahead and then we'll all yeah, I was going to say they took the data from this because they know that these cure cells have these inhibitory uh, items, right? So they wanted to know how that uh, how that plays into the, the the differentiation. So they looked at high and low cure uh, markers, and they conclude that the high expression of these inhibitory receptors suppresses activation and effector functions to allow precise control of their activity to avoid bystander suppression. So I don't understand what that is. Maybe you can explain that. Well, that's where I was a bit confused <laughs> because I think they described that the, the, the low <laughs> expression were the cytotoxic yep. cells. But then in yep. other experiments, they're, they're demonstrating that these cells are, in, they're killing by perforin, for example, which yeah, is yep. yeah, cytotoxic. Yeah. So yep. I guess that's may, maybe the nuance that we're missing here is because in the first experiments, they did not separate out function based on high or low expression. They just put no. them all together, mm-hmm. correct? which could have be the reason why the variation was quite high. That would be my guess. Yeah. I, you know, they, so the data that you're, we're, you know, skirting around here is looking at COVID patients, right? So that's that's where the COVID stuff comes in. And you've got severe disease, moderate disease, or mild disease. And it the, the expression of the cure on these CD8 uh, care T cells actually goes down as severity increases. And so the argument is that the cures are inhibitory, the, the particular one that's expressed is inhibitory. And so it is surprising, which is how we started this, like, how how do we wrap our heads around this entire paper? How can you have these cure CD8 cells, but yet they're able to eliminate cells if they're expressing an inhibitory receptor? And the argument is that if they have very high levels of inhibitory receptor, they are um, not killing a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. But if they downregulate it, now they don't have as much inhibition and they can kill. But then I still have the problem that if you're, killing the autoactive CD4 T cells that are causing a problem, shouldn't they be less in the more severe? But then you come back to the argument that Brianne was saying was, you know, is it the chicken or the egg? Are they there because they need to do their function or what? So, uh, um, Steph, did you want to? Ask something about that. No, that or? was that was actually exactly good. It. Right. Yeah, that was just the All question right. of high and low expression. Did mm-hmm. I did I summarize what everybody is thinking, or did you guys yeah. think no, no, something no, no. different? Did. Yeah, I did. No, I thought that. I was yeah. going to ask you that because I thought it was a naive uh, view of what's going on. Because yeah, you're absolutely to me anyway. Yeah, I I think the um, the idea of remembering that these are inhibitory receptors. Mm -hmm. And so um, having lots of them would inhibit cytotoxicity is sort of that key point that 
one has to keep remembering. Right. But if the if the argument is that these CRCD8 T cells are are blocking autoimmune pathology, mm-hmm. then one would think that the the more functional they are, the less inflammation and autoimmune immunity you will yeah. have. Right. But it seems to be the opposite. And Which so that's was, where I keep getting stuck. Yeah. Yeah, because well, that was kind of the synopsis of their first experiments, where, where right. that these cells have more function. They're killing. They're they're well, we don't know killing or not letting proliferate the CD4 T cells. But now with the COVID patients, right, that 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 paradigm we've maybe set up gets a little muddy. Yeah, I I think the the thing that that I I get stuck on is something from a little bit earlier in the paper, and this just sort of it, it hurts my brain and <laughs> sort of can't move past it. Is they show earlier. Um, that they they don't have an effect on um, the influenza specific CD eight yes. CD four cells yeah. that right. are right. expanded, yeah. and yeah. so those are expanded activated CD four cells. Yeah. So the yeah. implication here is that these these cure CD eights, these suppressor CD eights, or whatever we're going to call them, know the difference between bad guys and good guys in terms of CD fours. I wonder though, are you co- I, so? Is that also your statement in the context of the COVID right. data? Well, so, so, but then, but I think that that's what, especially if you look at the, at the very beginning of the paper and sort of the graphic abstract, mm-hmm. they, they show the cell only um, inhibiting the ones that have strong reactivity to self, not the ones right. with weak reactivity to self. They, right. they, they sort of imply there that there's this differentiation between or distinction between is this an appropriate or an inappropriate response. And so I think the idea would be, well, in the severe patients, it's an appropriate response because you need to get rid of virus. And in the less severe patients, it's an inappropriate response. But I still don't know how how the how the T cell knows who's a good guy and who's a bad guy. I that yes. that just my mind is blown. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, maybe maybe when you have a, an acute viral infection, the T cells that you're um, bringing in to the response are going to be the highly reactive foreign, you know, against foreign yeah. molecules, and so they would have very low autoreactivity. Right. Whereas if you have this low simmering, right, but in, then how do chronic how do inflammation? The, it how do the different. cure cells know which ones they're supposed to inhibit and which ah. ones they're not supposed to inhibit? <clears throat> well, that is that's right. That's question. a why that, question. That's right. what. That's where <laughs> yeah, I'm no, like. I got question. you. I don't know. But do that's, you think? Go ahead. That's, it, yeah. that's what has to be figured out, right? Yes. How yeah. do they distinguish? Yes. Well, and so we can think about the influenza experiment because those cells were not derived in an environment where influenza had caused severe disease. I think the distinction is severe disease causes a lot of cell death, a lot of damps, a lot of secretion of self, where a, a cure po- CD8 positive T cells would be beneficial in that situation because you have so many more autoreactive potential. I think the influenza experiment is just there weren't an, enough self, it, it wasn't from a severe influenza patient would be my mm-hmm. Assumption. Whereas with also the, could with, be timing, right? Well, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Because I, mean, I think a, an acute uh, an, a, an immune response to an acute viral infection is going to be different than as the virus goes away and the immune system is causing the damage. Which is because, why I think in the COVID you know, patients, correct, more severe. That, that second yeah. part is where you're going to have more of those autoreactive T cells. So right. maybe it doesn't know necessarily, but it's a timing thing. Like when those cells are are proliferating, that's when they're going to be functional. I don't know. And then the celiac experiment that the with with the gleed and that actually worked because it was from celiac patients where Correct. the inflammation yep. the yep. inflammation happened. So, yeah. All right. So next they look at infectious diseases and their idea is that so so you know the the old view is that during thymic development you get rid of self reactive T cells but we don't that doesn't always happen then you end up with self reactive. T cells, and that's partly why you have autoimmune diseases. But they say we think this is important. This happens because you need a big T cell repertoire to deal with infectious diseases. So you don't want to get rid of some of those potentially self-reactive. I don't know what. Do you think that makes sense, you guys? Yeah, yes. Is that good? Yeah, it does. That that is how I teach that. Yeah. Interesting. But right, you have to have a little bit of leakiness of, of autoreactive yeah. T cells because they could be cross-reactive to. Sure. Right, and, sure. and when you're and when you're doing selection in the thymus, given that you're selecting on kind of the whole surface of MHC plus peptide, yeah, it's really yeah. hard to get the selection perfect. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. 
So they they look at COVID patients. They have 53 patients, and they say these Kier CD8s are substantially elevated uh, in many of them, and they the higher levels correlate with more severe disease. So highest frequencies are in patients with vasculitis or embolism, acute respiratory uh, distress syndrome, all of which are caused by excessive inflammation, right? Yeah. So this gets back to what Cindy was saying. Well, if they're, yeah, exactly. if they're working, why are they <laughs> so high? Um, <laughs> they did not see differences in other in Tregs of a certain type, for example, or and right. cure and K cells, right? Um, uh, but they did find an increased frequency of uh, these cure CD8s in uh, peripheral blood of influenza patients. So they say, well, maybe they are induced as part of the response to infectious diseases as well as, uh, you know, uh, autoimmune diseases. What do you think about those those sets of experiments? I don't I don't know, <laughs> but I think that it's interesting. People have often had uh, the suspicion that viral infections might precipitate yeah, autoimmune yeah. disease, mm -hmm. and this might provide some explanation for how that might happen right mm -hmm. so that part that part i liked of i think course. that there's still small numbers yeah and it, it you know some people think that part of long covid is autoimmunity so correct. this would be interesting yeah. if it's yeah. correct right maybe maybe suggest some treatments right so seeing some these cells in long covid patients would you find them to be higher yeah that's a good do, have people looked do you know the, the, I, I think this is the first paper was, on said cells, so okay. no, I, I think, think it's yeah, I th Mark I think the first one. Long on COVID. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure, uh, they're I'm probably sure. collecting the data. <laughs> yeah, I'm it's sure. Probably they like are. in press, you know, it's some it's journals. in press. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. The, the next section, I'm very fuzzy on. They they did R single cell RNA seq on uh, CD8s from their healthy controls, MS patients, COVID patients, um, and look at. Uh, g single cell gene expression levels uh, to see, uh, you know, is there something in common amongst these cells in di from different patients, from autoimmune diseases and COVID patients and so forth? Um, it's interesting how you ask the question, right? Because if you look for similarities, you're going to see similarities because they're not going to be 100% <laughs> different, right? Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I guess the, the question is, are the healthy Cure CD8 cells similar in transcriptional profile to the ones that you find in disease. So coming back to that question mm -hmm. that we're saying, like if there are a lot of them there, is it they're just because they suck yeah, and you're right. recruiting more because you because they're not be able to do their job. So that's why they're accumulating, right? Because you just keep calling more in because they're not doing a good job. Whereas if in the healthy people are healthy because their cure CD8s do a great job. Um, but I think what what I interpret from this is that Definitely the, the, the ones from COVID-19 and from MS and, and even some of the healthy control share a yeah. reasonable yeah. amount of signature. But again, it, what is that level, right? Because you can set that bar however you want to say that there are similarities or there are differences. Yeah, and there are also some unique aspects, right? So they have a nice way of saying it. They have commonality and specialness. <laughs> <laughs> across the different <laughs> conditions. So, and that includes the healthy controls, right? Right. They also Did say you? that um, this, the, the data they accumulate suggests that these cured CD8s may lose their naive or memory attributes, enter the differentiation program, and then suppress pathogenic mm -hmm. CD4 cells through cytotoxicity. So if they're suppressing by cytotoxicity, are their cure le expression levels low? Because we said that low expression right. was associated with cytotoxicity. Yeah, yeah, right. Okay. Uh, then they looked in, some, in the same individuals at, at cure plus and minus T cell receptors, CD8 T cell receptors. And they find that the, the T cell receptor repertoire is less diverse than you would expect. And this is... Apparently, something that's been suggested before, um, and uh, then they 
they say, okay, what are the antigen specificities of these uh, cure cells from different uh, diseases? Uh, and they get evidence that um, they may be recognizing that uh, some of the same antigens that exist under common physiological and different pathological conditions. So they say these cells, the expanded cure CD8 cells, have shared phenotypes and antigen specificity independent of disease type. So it doesn't matter what the disease is, infectious disease or autoimmune, they have some shared antigen specificities, which is interesting, right? Okay, now we're going to do some experiments. The last set of experiments, they're actually going to go back to mice <laughs> and they're going to ablate LY49 CD8 T cells and then infect the mice with virus. I think this is kind of an important experiment. Yeah, because I think it's key. <laughs> for, for a lot of what we've talked about, we've, you know, do they correlate? Do they not correlate? How are we sure that they're actually acting? And so here we can actually try to see if they're doing something. Right. In mice. In mice. <laughs> Right. <laughs> so they, they are able to do this. I'm not going to go through how they did it, but they, do, they make a line of mice um, which are um, essentially LY49 is, is not going to be functional. And these mice don't have spontaneous autoimmune disorders. Their T cell frequencies seem to be the same. Okay, that's good. Because if they had spontaneous autoimmunity, that would be a problem. Right. Okay, then they infect them with lymphocytic choriomeningitis virus or influenza virus. So, um, let's see. Which mice did they? There was When they do this with wild-type mice, there's a surge of LY49 CD8 positive T cells in the blood of wild-type mice. However, in their uh, altered line of mice... Um, the frequency of those cells remains very low mm -hmm. all times after uh, viral challenge. Um, I, so that's interesting, right? They have ablated LY49 with a single amino acid change. So it must be interfering with some co-receptor interaction or something, right? Do you know how that works? I'm not mm -hmm. sure. I'm not uh... sure. I don't know exactly how that works. Yeah, not familiar with this model. Anyway, Wait. those mice have, have fewer, 50 to 75% less uh, LY49 CD8 C cells. Okay. And But interestingly, the, it's specific for the CD8s because the NKs have normal levels. Right. Right. So I, I think, I so these are DTA. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I think, it, yeah. yeah, so I think that what happens is... Um, the DTA is a toxin that's under the, a promoter, that's what um, I an LY49 type of promoter. Mm -hmm. So basically the LY49 cells make this toxin and die. Is that so diphtheria that's how they get, Is that diphtheria toxin? I think it's, yeah. it's, yeah. it's like okay. diphtheria toxin if it's not exactly okay. diphtheria toxin. <laughs> that's what and I so, thought it was too. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. So it... So basically, they're ablating these cells because when these cells develop, um, they turn on... Um, they have the promoter to turn on this specific toxin and and thus they die. So Is it the, it's the receptor. Well, or, or maybe yeah. that's the toxin. Yeah. But it doesn't matter. So the effect of this alteration is that when you infect the mice, you have low levels of these uh, LY49 CD8 T cells, right? Yep. Right. Now, these mice have no problem clearing virus. Correct. They have no problem with CD4 and CD8 responses. Right. But they get immunopathology, Correct. autoimmune immunopathology. They have uh, increased numbers of uh, follicular T cells, germinal center B cells in the spleen, glomerular nephritis, immunoglobulin deposition in the kidney. Yep. That's after LCMV. Same thing with influenza virus infected mice. They get all kinds of immunopathology. So that's a cool experiment. It kind of so, so uh, Cindy, your, your original question, if you take away the cells, they get worse disease, right? right. So yep. <laughs> that's, all right, So if you have the cells, you still get disease, but it's not as bad as if you didn't have any cells. Right, right. which <laughs> suggests that in individuals like our severe COVID patients who have high levels but still have severe disease, that they're dysfunctional in some way. Right. Mm -hmm. 
Now, the, these they did cells not you're have, talking about, right? Yeah. Correct. Like yeah. to correlate okay. to the human okay. data. Mm -hmm. Now, they didn't have the controls here for the uninfected. To see and, what, un, right? Yeah, because their original study, right, was in the in the EAE model. If they took away these cells and induced EAE, oh no, actually, you started out, uh, Vincent, by saying if they removed these cells in the mice, they got spontaneous autoimmune disease. No, they didn't get spontaneous, right? So if they remove the cells, the mice are okay without any virus infection. Right, when they did at the beginning. When they did the DTA model. Yeah, yeah. They did not appear to but spontaneously develop. they didn't show us those data. Right. Okay. Uh, right? Supplemental figure nine. <laughs> it is? I missed that one. Yeah, well, it's, you know, supplemental, right? <laughs> Easy to miss. I did look through them. Maybe I missed yeah, that. Yeah, they say there are no changes in, the no autoimmunity, no changes in uh, T cells of various sorts. Huh. It's just when you infect. So it's quite interesting that um, in the absence of these cells, a, a virus infection will lead to autoimmune responses. A, chron a chronic. Chronic. So these are, I mean, I mean the virus well, is gone. It's too, clear. Right? The virus oh, is clear. Right. Right. Yeah. And also, flu. Yeah. And that's, that's huge, I would think, right? So if it's the yeah. same in yeah. people, then that's a big deal, right? Right. So as Steph said, maybe people with long COVID have a problem with this subset, right, of some yeah, kind. Yeah, sure. Or, or yeah. right, and and probably there's multiple cells. I mean, we know NK cells. You know, there's other cells doing similar things than these. But we could look at just these and see. Are, you know, are they defective? Do they? Does their function go down as we age? Which, as other cells do, you know. Yeah, yeah it, they right. they show they. In the COVID patients, they're really looking at percentages. Mm -hmm. um, it would be cool if they could then try to show their ability to suppress, right. yes. say, those uh, gliadin-specific CD4s or something like that. Right, because if you have higher percentage, but then they, but they suck, right? They can't. Yeah. <laughs> they suck. That's got to be in the title now, right? <laughs> <laughs> they suck. <laughs> These cells suck at their job. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> so their idea is that because we have to have all these reactive T cells to deal with infectious diseases, this subset of Kirf CD8 has arisen to take care of that right. as right. best it can. Mm -hmm. But it's not always good at doing that. They suck at their job, right? <laughs> and those certain patients, maybe. So if the if the CD8 cures are defective, if you could figure out what's defective, you could then treat that, right? You could do gene therapy to treat it, maybe. Yep. At least maybe you could resolve long COVID. Right. Or, um, yeah. Yeah, so this def, def, if this is true, then you would have ways <laughs> of treating uh, long COVID, I guess. Lots oh. more experiments still to do, yeah. but sort of an interesting paradigm. And it didn't, I don't think that um, T-regs were really figured out overnight either. So it's not a criticism yeah. that there's a lot of work still to no, do. No, yeah. <laughs> It's not. So they also suggest in their discussion that if, and I, I thought this was actually a therapeutic suggestion, antibody dependent blockade of KIR 3 DL1 or, two, or L3 may further enhance the suppressive activity of KIR CD8s towards pathogenic CD4s. So these are inhibitory receptors, right? And they're saying if you block them with an antibody, maybe you can make the cells more. Um, able to kill, le suck less, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so maybe that would be a treatment for uh, long COVID, right? Right. Antibodies to, to these kind of like monoclonal therapy, right? To these cell surface. Yeah. Right. I think right. so that's what really attracted me to this, this overlap of autoimmunity and infectious diseases, which we know is a thing already. Yep. Oh, right? yeah. The sure. Epstein-Barr MS connection. Yes. Yep. Which we did on TWIV some time ago which I think so is a really cool great, papers. great uh, illustration of that. And I think what COVID offers, because what's really challenging to prove, one, it's in humans, and so we're also highly variable, but it's it's hard to know about viral-induced autoimmunity because you don't know when people are initially infected. And so it's hard mm -hmm. to track their symptoms based on a viral infection that you may or may not know you even had. And so COVID does offer this opportunity to say, okay, we know when the virus started circulating, people can pretty kind of, pinpoint where when they were infected and then yes now we can go back and do time course studies to see what may be going on so tell me what is the experiment to do with long 
COVID patients to see if there's something going on with these cure CD8s? What do you do? I think you could do a very similar experiment to what they did with the celiac patients. You, mm-hmm. you could you could pull cells from those individuals. I think the issue is with celiac, what's really nice is you have a, a defined antigen. And what's hard about long COVID is you don't have a defined antigen That's and then correct. very nice yeah. reagents like tetramers to right. be able to probe them. So... You have to find what antigen, if their cells are autoreactive, what is the antigen? I mean, there's a lot of thrombosis, so maybe some... I mean, I think you start by just asking if you have elevated CUR CDH, right? From peripheral blood. But I don't know where, you know, in this paper, they looked at tissues that are, you know, have pathology in the disease. But I don't know where you'd look in long COVID. Right. Probably different from everyone, right? But then, yeah, if you want to go beyond that and get mechanistic, then... You don't sure. know what the antigen is. Yeah. Maybe and that's this is, part of the study, right? You figure it out. Yeah. And maybe this, Brianna and Vincent, you know, because you've interacted with long COVID researchers, but uh, are there subsets of long COVID patients that have, okay, this this subset of long COVID patients has, they get rashes and they have this, I, I don't know, infl- like very defined so that maybe you could just study that one subset or is it not really I, defined? I way? am not aware of them being defined in that way. Yeah. Sure. Um, and, and so what I was trying to to understand, I was looking back at some of the other figures, um, is it's not totally clear to me, and I this is sort of related, related to the same issue that I've just been having, thinking this through, sort of how exactly these Kier positive CD8 T cells are specific to whatever this cell is that they are trying to, mm-hmm. to act against. Um, and so my question is, in this case, they used these cells from the celiac patients and then had them act against CD4s that responded to that antigen. But do you have to have that matching? Right. Can you have some other situation of some kind of pathogenic T cell that's pathogenic for whatever reason um, and see if the long COVID um, here plus CD8s would suppress. Right. Um, do you have to know what the antigen is? And I can't tell from these data and from this system whether what the answer is on that, if you have to know or not. No, is, one uh, of the things we didn't mention was, so these, these cure receptors that bind to MHC, mm-hmm. it's peptide dependent. So there has to be a peptide there, but it's not supposed to care what the peptide is. Right. So it's not clear to me how that CD8 cell is going to recognize the CD4 cell unless the CD4 cell is presenting a specific peptide in the context of MEC class 1 that the CD8 T cell recognizes. Right. So that would have is that an auto antigen? But how but how but it's for the in case of CD4 cells the CD4 cells are specific for the gliadin and let's stick to the celiac model, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. But what's in the it, what's in their MHC that doesn't it doesn't what's, have what's to be what's on the class one yeah that is being recognized is that also going to be a gliadin peptide perhaps I don't I know don't, I don't know I mean you you imagine that all nucleated cells are presenting self on class For, one all the time and and we're not supposed to respond to that right right exactly but these guys are supposed to be recognizing that to some degree because they're somewhat autoimmune the cure CD8s right. Right? right but but if they see that aren't they supposed to not kill especially if they have a cure. <laughs> Because it's inhibitory, right? Right. They say it goes back to that. I and mean, isn't that the whole point? Like, if you see, if you're, if you're looking, if you're seeing self peptide in MHC, and you have a cure, the, that's the combination where you're not supposed to kill. Well, but if the T cells are recognizing it, then so they, the T cells that recognize self are not are there, right? They're not eliminated. So, right. If they're there, they're gonna. React, yeah, and kill. And so they have to be there because the only thing that we can test against in, in the thymus is self. That's right. Right. There has to be another receptor. You know how we talked about right. that? There has cells to. have yeah. many of these receptors, and as Cindy described, depending on how you regulate. So I just, I'm wondering if a lot of our questions have to do with there are co-receptors that help determine this question of 
Yeah, something that the pathogenic cell expresses that is how it's recognized or something that the That's how it knows, peer like plus it cell um, has. Right. So is it always CD4 T cells that are the, the pathogenic cells in these autoimmune diseases? It can be no. others? What other nope, kinds? it can be CD8s. What about NKs? I can't think of an example, but in immunology, my feeling is probably. Never say never. I mean, there are (laughs) memory NK cells, right? So like it could be that they also play a role. And and they're defined by LY49. Right. So, but in in the diseases they looked at, the CD4s are involved, right? Yeah. But not CD8s or maybe. Mm. And so the question Uh, really is these cure CD8s, are they only regulating CD4s, or can they also regulate mm. CD8s? That goes back, I think, to the co-receptor issue. Yeah, I don't know. Because that would determine, I think, cell, cell specificity. Okay. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I discussed a little bit how the, the celiac disease works, but SLE is really an antibody-mediated disease. Mm-hmm. So that will involve CD4 T cells, because they're, they're going to give help to the B cells to make antibodies, but it's the antibodies and immune complexes that cause the disease. And in the uh, EAE it's, model, it's primarily the CD8 T cells that go in and damage the... There, and there's actually an antibody component too, I think. I thought the antibodies don't cross the blood-brain barrier very efficiently. There might be a uh, there might yeah. be a component of it, but I remember there was an antibody component, but that's that that's the end of where I remember. <laughs> we did. I think we did learn from a couple of papers ago uh, that IgA can make it to the brain. That in is EAE, true. We did. So. We did. We did that paper. You're right. Yeah. yeah. So Jenko. in the in the EAE model, it's CD8s that is that are doing the damage. Is that right? I thought so. Let's see. Depletion of CD8s in EAE, yeah. They don't actually mention that here. They, they do say in celiac it's CD4, mm-hmm. right? But they don't say what's doing it in EAE. All they say is that um, you can suppress it by uh, taking out these LY4, <laughs> right. L- LY49 cells, yeah. Okay. All right. That's... Uh, that's uh, what I thought would be cool. Hope you liked yeah. it. That was a yeah, good it was paper. fun. It was a good discussion. I learned a lot. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And now I happy, have lots of things I want to read. <laughs> happy, happy not exactly. to be an immunologist. <laughs> <laughs> I always say that about like NK cell immunologists. I'm like, oh gosh, that level. I mean, how many receptors does one need to uh, parse through? Well, so I, when I started digging, because I was like, I, so I know cures. And then I said, but wait. Are they, you know, what what is the range of cures and things? And I started taking notes on all of this, and it's more complicated than I realized. You know, I, I thought I knew a fair amount, but apparently I don't. Because there, <laughs> there there's like at least 13 or 14 genes, and they're highly polymorphic. Right. Right. Yeah, they're just and, after MHC in terms of polymorphism. Exactly, and 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 then they they've re, they have the whole nomenclature, which I looked up, which is interesting. And whether they have an L or an S is whether whether you can tell if they're inhibitory or stimulatory because of the length of the tail and things. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff related to that. And what, yeah. uh, the other thing I thought is really cool about this family of genes is its convergent evolution between the mouse and human. And the reason why they were interested in, in asking this question, why originally, why are, are there these cure CD8 cells similar to the LY49 CD8 is because cure and LY49, although they're functionally analogous, are, are actually completely different structurally. So the LYs are um, in an uh, electin family. Hmm. So they have a complete different structural domain, but the human ones are immunoglobulin based. Right. So they're, they're called different things because it's not actually the same family, although they analogously do the same thing on the NK cells or now on the T cells, which I also thought was really interesting. Yeah, it really, I mean, for for budding immunologists for trainees, there is so much still left to study. So mm-hmm. yeah, sure. study these. <laughs> uh, 
That's immune number 55. Show notes at microbe.tv slash immune. You can send us questions, comments to immune at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, consider supporting us, microbe.tv slash contribute. Cindy Leifer is at Cornell University. Cindy Leifer on Twitter. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you. Steph Langle's at Duke University. Stephanie Langle on Twitter. Yeah, thanks. This is great. And Brianne Barker's at Drew University. Bioprof Barker on Twitter. Thanks, Brianne. Thanks. It was great to be here. You are all now owned by Elon Musk. I know. Uh, <laughs> wow. Yeah, I was. I was wondering. Do we stay? Do we stay well, with Twitter, it, or do we not stay with Twitter? Has it been approved? I think that the bid has been made, but he still there still has to go through a lot of legal stuff. I think there does have to be some legal stuff. Well, and the board yesterday to, said okay. They they you know said it would be okay, so it has to go okay. forward. We'll see. You know, cure world hunger by yes, Twitter. Right. I mean, That's right. These are hard choices. Forty-four billion dollars. Hey, uh, Elon, microbe.tv slash contribute. (laughs) I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. The music on Immune is by Steve Neal. Thanks for listening to Immune, the podcast that's infectious. We'll be back next month. Mm -hmm.